I on? No, yep, there we are. Good morning, everyone. And you are very welcome to worship with us on this Pentecost Sunday. And if you're visiting with us, my name is Paul. I'm the assistant minister here. And later in our service, Graham, our minister, will be leading us in the next in our series on Daniel's, on the book of Daniel. And one of the things Graham is going to be thinking about with us is the idea of the sacred, that there are things in this world that we're to value and treasure because they are sacred. And I just wonder this morning, have you considered the extent to which this time together on a Sunday morning is sacred? Because it is, isn't it? In this next hour or so, we set aside all our activity, we lay down all our preoccupations from the week, and we turn our hearts together to worship our God. Our God who has given us the gift of his presence today, his promise and his power in the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes it can be hard to really inhabit that space, can't it? It can be hard to leave all the distractions at the door. And that's why, because we're human and every one of us needs God's help. So we're, we're going to turn to God now and ask him for that help. Um, as he invites us to worship him, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to set aside those distractions as we worship him together today. So I'm going to read some words of our call to worship. And after each sentence, I would invite you to say the words, come Holy Spirit. Okay, so come Holy Spirit. Let us pray these words. Spirit of the living God, visit us again on this day of Pentecost. Come, Holy Spirit. Like a rushing wind that sweeps away all barriers. Come, Holy Spirit. Like tongues of fire that sets our hearts aflame. Come, Holy Spirit. With speech that unites the babble of our tongues. Come, Holy Spirit with love that overlaps the boundaries of race and nation. Come, Holy Spirit, with power from above to make our weakness strong. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. And we continue now to pray for the Spirit's help as we sing the words of our first song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Let's stand and sing together.
Let us pray together. Lord, we do want to see you today. And we acknowledge that you are present with us even before we invoke your presence. Father, your spirit bestowed at Pentecost promised is promised to us always. So we rejoice today in your presence and in your promise. And we ask you to move among us as we worship you together. Today we come with all sorts of worries and concerns. Some of us are in the middle of assessments in school. Some of us have pressure at work. Some of us are coping with loss today. Lord, you know our individual cares and all our concerns. You know our hopes and our fears. You know our joys and our sorrows. So today, Lord, we confess again our need for you. And we confess how we've tried to do things on our own, how we've sought comfort and strength and assurance in things other than your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us and remind us again of the gift you gave us at Pentecost. Open the eyes of our hearts again to see the new life that you offer and give us the courage to receive it with open hands. We thank you today for your church, for our church family here at Kirkpatrick. And today we, we thank you that we can come to you together in fellowship and in worship from a whole variety of backgrounds from all walks of life, and yet, Lord, we are each one together in the Spirit. And so we thank you. We thank you that the promises we can count upon remain true today and always, just as they've been for generations before us. And we thank you that your mercies are great and everlasting. Amen. Well, Graham's going to come now and talk to the boys and girls. So, boys and girls, do you want to come up and join him at the front? Okay, everybody, do you want to come up? Take a wee seat. Oh, there we go. Take a wee seat at the front. Brilliant. Now, let me sit down here. Ooh. Now. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. See, you know, some of you might be really smart and get the answer to this question straight away, but, um, well, we'll see what happens. So there are three letters, and they, they stand for something, and everybody, every adult at least, uses this at some point nowadays, okay? The three letters are G, P, S. What does GPS stand for? Anybody know? Go on, Alfie. Yes, it is. But what does it stand for? Anybody know? Any ideas? Global Positioning System. That's what it stands for. Okay. So everybody, as you, as you said, Alfie, lots of people have one of these things in their cars. It's the sat-nav. It's a little map. Or most people have them on their phones. There's an app. On, your, on most people's phones that has a sat-nav on it that tells people where to go. Now, I'm going to try mine out this morning here to see if it works, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in, okay, Belfast. Oh, I need my glasses to see what I'm typing. I'm at Belfast City Hall, okay? There it is. Come up. Now, let me see if my sat-nav will start to give me directions to Belfast City Hall, okay? Let's go start. Head north on Eastleigh Crescent towards Upper Newtonards Road, A20, then turn left onto Upper Newtonards Road. Okay, brilliant. It's got the first bit right. Anyway, turn left onto the Upper Newtonards Road. That sounds right. And all the way down, it'll give you the list of where you're meant to go, okay, until you get to Belfast City Hall. Eventually, now, Belfast City Hall is not a particularly difficult one to find, I guess, whenever you head down the Newtonards Road and just keep going. But the GPS tells you where you are, so it told me that I was roughly on Eastleigh Crescent, which is out there, and told me how to get from there to Belfast City Hall. How does it do that? 
How does it do that? Anybody know how it does that? It's programmed to do it. It is, that's right. It's programmed to do it. But what it needs is it needs a couple of things. It needs to have a map in it, okay? It needs to have a map of really the whole world because the global positioning system. So it's got a map in it which tells you, tells, you know, gives you the directions, gives you the roads to go on, okay? And it has something else. It connects to, what does it connect to? It connects to the internet, yeah, and yes, a satellite way up there, way above the earth. It connects to a satellite, and the satellite knows where I am, knows where I need to get to, and knows how to get from here to there. That's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing technology that we have. Why am I talking to you about GPS this morning? Well, whenever we make our way through life, God knows that we need help to go in the right direction all the time. We need help to make the right decisions, make the right turns in life. And He gives us, I was going to say something, but actually someone to help us to make those right decisions, those right turns in life. It's a person. It's not a thing. And He's called the Holy Spirit. And He helps us to make the right decisions to go the right way in life. But He helps us in a particular way as well. Just like the GPS needs the map, we also need a map to help us. And the Holy Spirit helps us to understand the map. Can anyone guess what the map might be that the Holy Spirit helps us to understand? God? Mm, close, close. The Bible. the Bible, exactly. The Bible is the map that that the Holy Spirit helps us to understand. So when we read the Bible, He helps us to understand it and helps us to see how we live our lives according to the Bible. Some people rely on how they feel to make their decisions. Some people rely on their, their feelings. That's not always the best thing. Our feelings aren't always the most helpful guide. But the Bible and the Holy Spirit helping us will help us to understand how God wants us to live. In our story from Daniel this morning, Daniel has a decision to make. He has a decision about whether or not to tell the truth to the king. And the truth that he had to tell the king was difficult. It was going to be bad news. It was going to mean the end of the king's kingdom. So you could understand Daniel might not be, you know, if he was going by his feelings, Daniel might be thinking, this is a bad thing to tell the king. This might not be good. But he knew what God's word said, and he knew that God's spirit was guiding him to tell the truth. And that's exactly what he did. So whenever we need help to make the right decisions in life, we need God's Word, the Bible, to help us. And we need the Holy Spirit to help us to understand it. And God gives us the Holy Spirit to help us. And that's what we celebrate today in church. Today in church, Paul's already mentioned it, is Pentecost Sunday. It's the day when we remember that God gave His Holy Spirit to those who follow Him to help them to follow Him, to help Him to live in the right way. We're going to pray to Him just now and thank Him for giving us the Holy Spirit and helping us to guide, helping uh, for, uh, to help us to be guided by Him. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank You for sending Your Holy Spirit into the world at Pentecost. Thank You that He guides us in every step of life however young or small we are, however big or old we are, thank you that the Holy Spirit is there to help us to make the right decisions, to listen to your word, and to walk your way. Help us to, to listen to him and to do that all of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to sing. Uh, do you want to go out while we sing? Okay, so we'll stay, if you stay for the first verse and then go out after the first verse, we're going to sing a song called All My Days.
So we continue reading in the book of Daniel this morning, picking up Daniel chapter 5, and you can find it on page 889 in the Pew Bible. So we're just reading verses 1 to 7, and then verses 31, or 13 to 31. Let's listen to the word of the Lord. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and the silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third greatest ruler in the kingdom. And then verse 13. So Daniel was brought before the king. And the king said to him, Are you, Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing, And tell me what it means. You will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Your majesty, the most high God, gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the most high God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. You... Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. And here's what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, 
your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Amen. Thanks, Paul. Let's pray together as we come to think about God's Word. Lord God, for many of us, this story is familiar, and yet it's all so strange. So, Lord, help us to understand Your Word for us today. Help us to understand what it's saying and how it's guiding us in the way you would want us to live. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul mentioned earlier uh, exam and assessment season, and we are uh, fully into that in our house. Uh, Andrew, uh, as many of you know, has been sitting his A-levels, and he's been using this A-level season to share with me the salient and important points uh, of the reigns of each of the Stuart monarchs, uh, from James VI and I to William and Mary. And he, to be fair, he does seem to know a fair bit about their reigns. I, having listened to him uh, share these salient points, or to put it more accurately, having been in the room while he's been talking, um, I'm not much more informed uh, than I was before, but that's probably down to me rather than Andrew. But one thing that has stuck with me is this. Some of those Stuart monarchs back in the day seem to have been pretty bad at learning from the mistakes of history. And so, as the saying goes, they were condemned to repeat them. It seems that a lot of the same issues that led to Charles I losing his head also led to James II losing his throne. But they're not the only kings who fail to learn from history. In Daniel 5, in the darkest chapter of the book of Daniel we've encountered yet, we meet a king who is spectacularly terrible at learning from history. It begins with astonishing debauchery, drunkenness, and blasphemy. It continues with supernatural horror, and the story concludes with an invading army killing the king. To be honest, Daniel 5 seems to be closer to an episode of Game of Thrones than to a typical Sunday school lesson. And yet, in this dark and difficult chapter, there is a message for our contemporary culture a message for the contemporary church, and a message for every contemporary individual in the streets and neighborhoods of our very 21st century city. But before we get to those messages, we need to get an understanding of what's going on in Babylon in 539 BC. We've left Nebuchadnezzar behind in chapter 4. And suddenly we are dropped into the court of King Belshazzar. But the gap in time between chapters 4 and 5 is about 23 years. A series of successors to the great King Nebuchadnezzar have arisen and successively been deposed in the intervening years. And at this point, the official Babylonian ruler is actually a man called Nabonidus, a son of Nebuchadnezzar. But for various political and religious reasons, Nabonidus is not a particularly popular figure in the city of Babylon. And so he spends a lot of time away from the center of power, handing over responsibility for the kingdom to his son, the more politically acceptable Belshazzar. In the meantime, Babylonian power is on the wane. 
and the empire of Persia is becoming dominant. Daniel 5 takes us from an empire at its height under Nebuchadnezzar to an empire on its last legs. In fact, what we're dropped into here in chapter 5 is the very last night of the Babylonian Empire. After a siege, Persian troops have breached the outer defenses of the city. They're making their way through the city streets. And while they're doing that, what is Belshazzar, the regent king of Babylon, doing? He's partying. He's living it up. And this is not just any old party. Daniel 5 verses 1 to 4 gives us a picture of a king who is totally out of control. A king engaged with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines in the most excessive debauchery and drunkenness imaginable. It's probably these four verses that give rise, if you like, to the popular image of Babylon when we think of that word in in popular culture, an image that persists even to this day with a movie called Babylon released last year depicting the the decadence and depravity of 1920s Hollywood. And to top the whole event off, to top this debauchery and this drunkenness off, Belshazzar does something that not even Nebuchadnezzar at his most arrogant would have done. He orders the goblets that were seized from the Jerusalem temple half a century before to be taken out of storage, and to be brought into the party so that he can use them to toast the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. It's an act of supreme arrogance, and for a Jewish reader of this text, blasphemy. Belshazzar is deliberately and consciously treating sacred things with total profanity. And this is not an act of drunken spontaneity. It's calculated. It's an intentional act. Belshazzar is saying that just as he possesses the items from the temple, so he owns the God of the Hebrews. And he can do whatever he pleases with him and with his things. And of course, it's at this point that the party takes a sudden, unexpected, and terrifying turn. The fingers of a human hand appear out of thin air. They begin to write a message on the wall. And of course, we get our phrase, the writings on the wall, from this moment in Daniel. One suggests that interpretation of the king's response to this site, uh, when it says about him, his knees knocking and all the rest of it, one suggested interpretation is that he has lost control of his bodily functions. He screams for the usual suspects, the astrologers, the magicians, all the enchanters to be brought in. He offers them wealth and power if they can interpret the writing on the wall. And once again, as we've come to expect, if you've been paying attention in the book of Daniel, the advisors, the astrologers, the enchanters are no use whatsoever. As Chris Wright Riley observes in commenting on this, incompetence, of course, has never been a disqualification for political office. But there is one senior statesman who is left with a reputation for solving the most difficult of problems. The queen, more likely the queen mother, advises Belshazzar to send for Daniel, and he does. Daniel has more than likely been sidelined for a couple of decades since the death of Nebuchadnezzar. But now, in this moment of crisis, he's back at the center of political life in Babylon. Daniel is by now in his mid-80s. And he refuses the offer of wealth and status offered by a king whose time is almost up. But he continues to do what he has always done. 
he continues to be faithful to the revelation given him by God, even when the message is difficult for his listener to hear. Daniel, as we've discovered throughout, will always be the one to speak truth to power. And the message is as clear as it is stark. Belshazzar, you have failed to learn the lessons of history. You have deliberately and intentionally set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You have profaned and dishonored His name, and as a result, your days are numbered. You've been weighed in the scales and found to be wanting, and your kingdom is divided and destroyed once and for all. And the end comes quickly. That night, we're told in verse 30, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And the Babylonian empire falls to the Medo-Persian empire. And the rest, as the historian Tom Holland might say, is history. That's all very well, you might say. And depending on how much you really enjoy ancient Near Eastern history, you might even find it a very interesting episode. But I told you at the beginning that this dark end to the Babylonian Empire has a direct message for us, for our contemporary church, our contemporary culture, and every individual in our contemporary Western world. So what is it? Let's start with the message to our culture. And I think it's this. God is not mocked. The other night, uh, I was flicking through the the channels and I came across a stand-up show uh, by the comedian, late comedian, Sean Locke. If you don't know the name, uh, he was a regular, uh, regular panelist on the Channel 4 show, 8 out of 10 Cats Does Countdown, up until his death in 2021. And Locke's particular brand of humor, it's a little bit surreal, but it also depends on creating a persona who is permanently grumpy and angry and lets the smallest little things annoy him. In the short clip that I was that I saw, he described how these little things annoy him. And they lead him to such frustration. It's small things like, you know, the the hot water not being on when he gets in the shower or whatever. These small things would lead him to such frustration that he would yell the words, Jesus Christ, at the top of his voice. And that's what he did in the stand-up routine. He would yell the words at the top of his voice and predictably the audience would dissolve with laughter. This was not a slip of the tongue when he was hitting uh, his, uh, his thumb with a hammer. This was intentional, deliberate use of the name purely in order to get an audience to laugh. You can see perhaps why I only watched a short clip before turning over. This is a relatively small example of a culture which doesn't just ignore God, but actively defies Him. And of course, defiance of God is the essence of sin, isn't it? Remember, Belshazzar's sin was not one of ignorance, but of insolence. Belshazzar knew what had happened with Nebuchadnezzar. He'd either witnessed it himself or at least heard about it. He was not unaware of how God had humbled the great king, nor of how Nebuchadnezzar had credited God with granting him his rule in the first place. He knew it all, and it made no difference to him whatsoever. Our culture is often described nowadays as post-Christian. We're worshiping new gods today, not perhaps the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, but certainly the gods of power and status and wealth and pleasure. Although if we're honest, these new gods, they're not really all that new. 
They're just packaged in new ways. And let's be even more honest, the worship of these gods did not sort of come to an end during the 1,500 years or so that we called Christendom. They were always there. And these gods are just as useless and lacking in foundation as Belshazzar's gods made by human hands. The hope of our culture will not be found in pursuing the empty promises of false gods. It will not be found in self-proclaimed wisdom or in the conscious, deliberate defiance of God. No, the hope for our culture is to be found in the increasingly dismissed, denied, and dishonored name of Jesus Christ, who came to redeem both culture and creation. Hope is to be found when we cry out His name, not to get a laugh from an audience, but in repentance and faith. Hope is to be found when we look at the scandal and foolishness of the cross and see there the wisdom and the power of God. The hope for our culture comes when we recognize that God has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed, and that He's given proof of this by raising Him from the dead. And this message for our culture is a message for every individual within it. It's certainly a message of warning, just like this message that many people will be familiar with written on the steps at Port Stewart Strand. Danger, don't swim near the rocks. Anyone who lives in Northern Ireland who's taken a trip to the North Coast has seen this sign. It's not written there to spoil your fun day at the beach. It's written there to keep you from injury and maybe even to save your life. To ignore it or defy it is both foolish and dangerous. Well, the warning message of Daniel 5 and of the gospel is exactly that kind of message. It's telling us that it's time to stop knowingly dismissing and defying the Christ who is both your ultimate judge and your only rescuer from sin and death. To continue defying Him is both foolish and dangerous. It's time we're being told to pay attention to the invitation that Jesus offers to find full, abundant, eternal life in Him. It's time to investigate this person, His life, His death and resurrection, pay attention to Him, see why He and He alone is able to offer you a life set free from guilt and shame and sin and fear. It's time to turn back to the one who never stopped loving you, and longing to give you fullness of peace and joy. It's in Him that you will find rest for your souls, rest that the gods of our culture will never supply. The gods of wealth and status and power and sex will only demand more and more and more of you, and they will never deliver the satisfaction that they promise. Only Jesus can deliver rest, hope, and peace for the weary, sorrowful, troubled soul. It's time to receive His overabundant grace poured out for you at the cross, where He bore there the penalty of all your defiance and dismissal of Him. No matter how many times you, like Belshazzar, have spat in God's eye, the message of the cross is that He faced the judgment you deserve so that you could experience the life only He deserves. But there's a message here for the contemporary church as well, and it's this, be careful. 
Be careful how you treat the things that God sees as sacred. And we're not talking about goblets and furnishings from a temple here. We're not even talking about a communion table or a pulpit. This is a warning not against behaving, you know, like the the Nazis at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark with the Ark of the Covenant. It's not a warning about that. Rather, it's a warning about everything that God sees as sacred. So we're to treat the creation around us as sacred and take seriously our responsibility for it because He made it and He gave it to us to look after. We're to treat the time that we are given here as sacred and use it for His purposes and for His glory. And above all, I would suggest we're to treat other people as sacred. Remember that God has made every person in His image. Every person. So the people of God need to be at the forefront of making sure that every person is treated with dignity, respect, care, whether they're young or old, born or unborn, black, brown, or white, male or female, gay, straight, or transgender, Muslim, Jew, atheist, or agnostic, or any other. It doesn't matter whether they're a young person with a severe learning difficulty or an older person with dementia. It doesn't matter whether, whether they are the owner of a super yacht or whether they're crossing the English Channel in a small boat. Every single one of the eight billion people on this planet is created by God in His image. And yes, that image is tarnished and distorted by sin in every single one of us, but every single one of us is still worthy of honor and respect. We need to treat every person as someone for whom Christ died. The gospel requires us to treat even our most violent enemies as image bearers to be loved. And it's also a reminder that He has, by grace, made every Christian believer a dwelling place of His Holy Spirit. As we think about this on Pentecost Sunday, that the Holy Spirit has come to dwell within every single follower of Jesus Christ. So we need to treat one another with care and with love. You and your fellow believers have been set apart, made holy through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You and they are incredibly precious to Him. And so malicious gossip and personal attack and controlling behavior should have no place within the body of Christ. The body is diverse. We won't always agree with one another. We'll differ from one another on every theological, ecclesiological, and ethical issue. We'll be different from one another. We'll differ on our politics will differ on the right direction to take congregational life. Our different personalities will not always sit comfortably with each other. But together, you and I, we make up the bride for whom Christ died. Together, we make up the family He called into being at the cross. And so, because we love and honor Him, we will treat one another with love, compassion, and generosity, and humility. Because each one of you is sacred to Him. Just as Daniel lived through the collapse of two kingdoms, Judah and then Babylon, I would suggest there's ample evidence for
for us today that we're living through what may be the last days, certainly of the powerful influence of Western civilization. If the 19th century was the the century of British imperialism and the 20th century was the American century, then it's looking very much like the 21st century is going to be the Chinese or the Asian century. And for our Western culture, that presents an issue. And yet our Western culture seems determined whatever else is going on to keep on partying to excess, to keep on glorying in our technological prowess, and to keep on defying God, just like Babylon. So what are we to do? Well, I know that at the beginning of this series, I said that the message of Daniel is not simply be like Daniel. But in this one instance, I think we do need to learn from Daniel. We need, like Daniel, to be pastorally sensitive to the brokenness of our culture, prophetically aware of the challenges of our culture, and prayerfully concerned for the future of our culture. We need to not disengage from the culture. We need to not necessarily go to war with the culture either. But we need to keep working in the culture as a faithful presence, bearing witness to Jesus Christ through our words and our deeds, even when we're ignored, sidelined, misrepresented, or even attacked. We need to take the opportunities that we're given to speak into the culture even if it sometimes means delivering unpalatable messages, even perhaps especially if it means speaking the truth to power. And we need to do these things in the knowledge, in the certainty that God's mustard seed kingdom, that He began in the Gospels, will keep growing Unseen, yes, largely. Forgotten, yep, largely. Ignored, absolutely. But it will keep growing until all of creation is redeemed. All of culture is redeemed. And the whole earth is filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes we find our culture and our times difficult and confusing. Sometimes we're heartbroken by what we see around us. Sometimes we don't know what to do or where to turn. Help us by your Spirit to live in ways that are faithful to you, compassionate and loving, treating the things that you see as sacred as being important and worthy of honor and respect, and bringing glory to you in our everyday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing uh, a hymn which we often sing at the beginning of a sermon, but actually I think is appropriate at this point. It's asking God to speak into our lives and into our culture today until His glory comes. Speak, O Lord.
Just looking for Mary Rose of Cotter. <laughs> Mary Rose, I know you want to make a quick announcement. And while Mary Rose is getting to the front, um, just let me mention before I have a couple other things after Mary Rose, um, but to mention the summer mission grants for any of our young people involved in, in serving on a team or, or going overseas perhaps in the summer. Um, you may already have read in the weekly email that anyone who's planning on serving on a summer mission program whether it's at home or abroad, is welcome to apply for a summer mission grant. But the closing date for this is this Wednesday. So I'm not great at getting forms in on time, but do try to do that. If you're going away, get a form in. You can, you can see the details in the email or email Alex directly and she will send you the information. But that's Wednesday is the deadline for that. Mary Rose. Good morning, everybody. In July and August, many of the rhythms of church congregational life stop. Quite rightly, many members who serve um, need, a deserve, need and deserve a well-earned break from organizations and meetings. And many get away on holiday for a break. But for some, this can mean July and August can be particularly lonely or simply become two months of days that are hard to fill. So we're doing something a little different this year. Cafe Connect at Kirkpatrick. Every Thursday afternoon in July and August from two o'clock to four o'clock, we will have a cafe open in the Forbes Hall. It's open to everyone and it's free. Each week we'll be, we will be traveling to a different country for a few minutes to hear some quirky facts about the place while sampling a little delicacy from that country. On the final Thursday in August, the 31st, we hope to go on an outing. And at this stage, it's a mystery tour. And that's because it's a mystery to me as well. <laughs> so every Thursday from two in July and August, it'll be a chance to connect with a bit of crack and a coffee. Reminder cards like these are available in the church vestibule. Take or give to anyone who might enjoy this summer connection. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Rose. Um, just a couple more announcements from me. Um, tonight, we continue our prayer course. And we've talked this morning, haven't we, about the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives and how we need the Spirit's help. And of course, we need to pray. And I've been really blessed by this series. I'm not gonna be, be there tonight. I have to speak at a thing in Armagh but I'll be back again next week. But do come along tonight. And for our young people at District, there'll be prayer for you tonight as well, and pizza. Um, the rest of us don't get pizza at the prayer course, but pizza and prayer for District tonight at 8 until 9.30. Just two other things to mention. Next Sunday, we're going to have our new members service where we'll be welcoming some of our young people taking up membership, and we'll be celebrating communion together. And then the Sunday after that, Sunday the 11th of June, we have our church picnic. And breaking from tradition, we're going to Stormont Park this year, but go to the Massey Avenue entrance to Stormont Park. I think there's a, what is it, a fun run, a color run. And if you don't know what a color run is, that's where people throw powdered color at you as you're running. So we wanna keep away from that for our church picnic. So we're gonna to go to the Massey Avenue end of Stormont Park, and we meet there Sunday the 11th of June after the service. Um, we're gonna, bring our offering to God now. Um, this is an opportunity for our members here in church to make their, their offering. Um, but if you're a visitor with us, please don't feel in any way obligated to give. And as we do that, we're going to sing together, This Earth Belongs to God.
Adam talked about our need to show dignity and respect to the things God calls sacred. And in particular, he mentioned creation and other people made in the image of God. Um, this morning, we're going to pray for creation together. And we're also going to focus some of our prayers on the country of Lebanon. Um, I'm involved in a group in, in the Presbyterian Church looking at the Middle East and how we can stand in solidarity with the church there. And this week, we heard a report from the moderator's recent visit to Lebanon. Um, so we're going we're gonna to focus on Lebanon as we think about our responsibility to care for our fellow people in this world. Let's pray together. Our loving God, um, as we've just sung, this earth does belong to you. You made all creation for the praise of your glory. And you've entrusted us with the sacred responsibility of caring for this world and all creatures within it. In response to this holy calling, we turn to you now in prayer for this world and for its people. And we begin by praying for creation itself. Lord, you made the world good, but we've not valued it as we should. We've too often looked upon your creation as a commodity. And in so doing, we fail to see the wonder there is to behold in this theater of your glory. And so this morning, we pray that you would help us to see the world in you again. Help us to receive creation as a sacred gift. And help us all to be convicted by our primary calling to be good stewards of all you've entrusted us with. In particular, this morning, we pray for humility, for wisdom, compassion, and courage for all those called to leadership in our world as they seek to tackle the challenges of climate change. And we pray too for vulnerable groups across the globe facing the worst of these challenges, often the poorest among us, facing flash floods, forest fires, devastating and unpredictable drought. Lord, today, by your spirit, we pray renew your creation. And Lord, you, you made creation to be sacred, and so you made people. We have been created in the image of your likeness. We valued and loved by you. And yet, Lord, we do not treat one another with dignity, nor do we value human life as you've called us to. This morning, we lift up all who suffer in your world today, and in particular, we pray for the people of Lebanon, a country who's close to the hearts of many in this church. We're thankful that the moderator of our church was able to visit Lebanon this past week to show our solidarity with the church in this broken state. We pray for all those seeking to show love and compassion in this dire situation as economic foundations crumble, as state infrastructure buckles under the strain. We pray that your people would know you as their rock and their strength. May your spirit work powerfully in this place to bring hope and salvation in the midst of despair. And finally, Lord, we bring before you all known to us personally who are suffering at this time. We pray for those carrying sickness today or for those walking with bereavement. We pray for those struggling with mental health. And in particular, we pray for Michael Bradley and his family after the death of Michael's mom yesterday. May you be with her husband, Doug, and the wider family who grieve the loss of a wife, mother, sister, grandmother today. Thank you, Lord that in you we have the hope of resurrection. May your spirit comfort the Bradley family with that hope today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we are thankful for all God has done for us, and we rejoice now um, in our last hymn of praise, When I Was Lost, You Came and Rescued Me. Let's stand and sing together.
old is gone, the new has come. Hallelujah. Let's say the words of the grace together. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.